so uh, this is a talk on category parametric programming. If you don't know what that means, that's OK. We'll, we'll get there. Um, I am Greg File. Uh, I've written Scala for about four years, coming from Haskell, which is a little weird and definitely informs some of the weird stuff you'll see up here. Um, I work for a company called Formation, um, which is hiring Scala engineers, if anyone wants to talk to me. Um, very happy. And, and also, if any of this stuff, don't expect that this is the stuff that you need to know in order to work there. I guarantee you it is not. Um, and uh, there are some people whose names you might be familiar with uh, who also work there with me uh, that are fun people to work with. Uh, Ross Baker, uh, HTTP4S, he is you know, the, the lead developer for. Uh, Chris Nuttycomb, a uh, very widespread speaker. And Paul Snively, um, also a very prominent figure in the Scala community. Um, so yeah, that's where I work, uh, have fun, and definitely have gotten feedback from various people at, at work and outside of work uh, on this talk. So um, you know, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of smart people doing cool things that it's great to learn from. Um, so this talk, uh, so, oh, so people who, who know me um, might know that I've done some recursion scheme stuff. Uh, there's a library, Matroshka, that I think there's a talk on tomorrow. Um, uh, I'm not sure what time slot, but I'm definitely going to be at that one. I'm very curious to see people talking about code I've written. That's pretty neat. Um, and I've ported Matroshka to, to Scala or to Cats, and I called it Turtles. And the most qu frequent question I get these days is, where are the turtles? Because it has never actually been released. Uh, and it turns out it will never be released. Uh, so I'm retiring Turtles before it's actually been, been released. Um, instead, uh, Andy Scott has um, started a new library that I am um, now also a maintainer on, although I haven't actually contributed yet. There's plenty of other people who have been contributing. Um, but Drosta, which is the, um, the new recursion schemes for cats library. So if you've ever heard about Turtles, stop looking for it and look for Drosta instead. Uh, that'll be the, the new hotness. Uh, and also in the world of recursion schemes, um, Valentin uh, has started this project that I have contributed to, but all of my work is on a branch on my fork that after I'm mentioning it up here, I should probably get merged into <laughs> Valentin's. Uh, but, but the idea is that if you've heard of recursion schemes, if you've seen a talk on them, and you're just kind of confused about what to actually do with them, um, this cookbook is designed to you know, help you solve specific problems um, in very much the kind of, I want to do this thing. How do I do it with recursion schemes and, and walk through in that approach? So recursion scheme stuff is not on the docket for today's talk, but, um, but I'm happy to talk about it outside of the talk. And here's what's going on with it in my life. Um, so yeah, so today's talk is about category theory and um, this notion of category parametric programming. And so I figured I'd start with the, um, the inspiration um, for this notion of category parametric programming. Uh, it came from a a uh, paper, oddly enough, about recursion schemes, um, one of those things I spent a lot of time on. And uh, it's this great, great quote that you know, is saying that pretty much everything in category theory is parametric over the category. Um, right? So you can apply the same things to different categories. And so that means that you can like, avoid repeating yourself like crazy. And, um, and you know, there's, there's perhaps a new style of programming to, to be discovered called category parametric programming where we can actually think and operate the level of categories and get, um, you know, get some of those benefits. And so this talk is really about um, what we can do with that a bit in Scala, what we can't do with that in Scala yet, why we might want to do that, and why we might not want to do that in various cases. Um, I don't think any language out there is, um, you know, is very well suited to this notion of category parametric programming yet. Um, not Haskell or or other fun things, um, but uh, but you know there's there's lots of lots of ways we can get get closer to it, and so that's what I want to want to talk about. Um, also, uh, if people have questions, um, feel free to ask some while the slides are up, or hold them to the end. Doesn't matter. We can, you know, uh, I want I want people to have some some familiarity with what's going on and not get not get too lost on things. Um, so I'm going to start with. Uh, what I'm calling the familiarity calibration. So everyone can just like raise their hands when they understand what's on the slide and put their hands down when they don't. There's no like right or wrong answer. Definitely people come to different ideas at different points and in different directions and all the time. So I just want to get a sense of, of where we're starting at um, and what maybe I should explain in a bit more detail. Um, so the first thing is this is the um, build that SPT. Uh, you don't have to understand that. But, but it does contain everything that's required for this, uh, for this talk. Um, the talk is a literate, this is a literate presentation, so this is actually what's used to compile 
all the code in the talk. And all the code in the talk compiles, except for one slide, which I point out does not compile. Um, so yeah, so it actually works. Um, everything in here actually works. Um, so it uses higher kinds, kind polymorphism, which is a concept that I don't expect people to be familiar with. Uh, cats is um, kind of the basis for a lot of the stuff, all those type classes. And then there's a compiler plugin called Kind Projector, which is very useful when working with functional programming and, uh, and that stuff. So we'll, we'll kind of go through that. And the only import is, uh, is cats implicits through the whole thing. So. Um, so are people familiar with Kind Projector? I think that is. Getting some hands. Okay. So, so Kind Projector is a compiler plugin that basically gives you a way to partially apply types. Um, so in that first case, that either string question mark, that question mark basically creates a new, is, is, gives you a new type that takes a single parameter, right? So it fixes the string, but leaves the second parameter unspecified. Uh, and then you can, it works in lots of different ways. So in the second one, you can see that that question mark has the, um, you know, has the um, type brackets with a, with a missing parameter. And that says that that is a, you know, has to be a functor level type of some sort. It could be uh, option or list again or, or whatever uh, other thing. But, but the, the kind, the shape of the type is specified um, using those, those brackets. Um, that's kind of character. So you'll see those question marks kind of scattered throughout the, the code. And that's, they're just holes basically in the type um, that have yet to be specified. Uh, composition. People familiar with this idea of taking two functions and you know basically using an operator to compose them together as opposed to you know say writing out a function that directly applies them and creates a new function. Um, I mean those are equivalent statements, um, but composition is something that comes up a lot when dealing with categories, as you'll see. Uh, higher order functions, functions that take or return functions. Cool, that looks pretty solid. I figured that would be pretty solid. Um, and then type classes. All right, this is good. Um, and again, feel free to ask questions. Mono, monoids, sorry, in particular. All right. And categories. All right, cool. Well, that, that's good because that's that's where we're going to start. Uh, it's talking about categories. Uh, so, in a categorical, in a category theory sense, um, what is a category? Um, so, it's pretty vague because it kind of has to describe everything anywhere. So a category has objects. You don't have to know in the abstract what those objects are. They just are objects. And it has what are called morphisms between objects. Uh, they're also referred to as arrows. I probably use arrows and morphisms kind of interchangeably in the talk, because I just use both those words. Um, and, uh, and so just to, to kind of point to what we're talking about here, the objects here are types, uh, which in this case are all parameterized. Uh, and then the, uh, the morphisms are uh, indicated by this arrow, which is not the standard Scala function arrow, but it's, it's, I chose it in order to look like functions, right? So this looks like a function here, but it's really uh, a morphism from A to A, from that object to that object, right? And so arrows in a category can be composed. So I just you know, asked about composition, and so you can have a compose operation on, in a, on a category uh, that says given some morphism from this object to that object and a different morphism from this object to that object, you can compose them such that you now have a morphism from this object to this object. Does that, that make sense to everyone so far? Um, and, uh, and for each um, object, there's also an identity morphism, uh, often called identity. Uh, and you'll see, uh, you know, you see that in Scala pre-def, there's an identity for function, right? Um, and in fact, the first category we'll talk about uh, is an instance of this type class. Uh, it's called Scal, kind of an analogy with Hask. I don't know if anybody else uses this term. I swear I've heard it before. But Scal being the category where the objects are Scala types and the arrows are functions, right? So this is a category, right, where functions, and this is just an alias for the regular Scala um, double arrow, and so, um, which you have to use in this context, I think. Um, so anyway, this is, this is the category Scal. Um, we have regular types and functions as the arrows. Regular types as objects, and these are the arrows. And so in this, right, we just use the pre-def identity, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, is the identity operation uh, for each object in, uh, in this category. And composition is just regular function composition, um, which is on the function type. Uh, so pretty simple. Basically, the names are pretty close to what we already see, right? And like, 
This is definitely the category we spend almost all of our time working in when we're dealing with Scala, right? Everything is about types and functions between those types. Um, here's another category um, that you might be less familiar with. Uh, how many people are familiar with Cleisley, actually? Oh, there's a good number. Cool. Uh, so Cleisley category, um, the arrows are a little different. Uh, so the arrow is between A and B still, but it has this extra F. So um, what that means is you actually have a function that looks like A to F of B, uh, which you might be familiar with if you're, you know, with flat map, right? A common uh, operation in Scala. And, um, and, but the interesting thing here is that the, arrow, the, the F is part of the arrow, right? It's not part of the result type. Uh, I mean, it, 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 sorry, it's not part of the, the destination object, I should say, which is strictly B. Right, so, so really the, the generic form of Cleisley is like underscore arrow f of underscore, right, where those, those underscores are your objects in the category. Um, and so there's an instance for this, this category as well, where if m is a, is a monad, um, then you can have a, a category for uh, Cleisley m, right, there's a Cleisley category for m, uh, in which the identity operation is pure, right, so that's like, that's the function for given any a, give me you know a inside that monad, right? Um, I th and uh, and the composition operator is a little more complicated, but it's it's Cleisley composition. So you end up with a function um, from a to m of c, uh, which is done by basically you use this run to unwrap the Cleisley, right? So this gives you the the underlying function, which you can then apply uh, to a value, and you flat map over it. And so now we have two different categories to work with, right? We have the regular category of Scala with Scala functions uh, as the arrows, and now a Cleisley category um, that gives you this very monadic um, looking thing, right? That uh, looks like flat map. And so in a category, what is there anything that like seems to be missing from here? It's like we've got all these things um, and but basically the only thing we can do with them is compose them, right? There's no, we have nowhere in this do we have our hold on an object, right? Like we have a value ID that is an arrow itself between two objects, and we have this composition that allows us to combine arrows, but nowhere do we have an A or a B or a C, right? All we can do with this is compose things. It turns out that's enough to do like everything. Um, but it does, it does mean that, um, that there is a, sort of unfamiliar style that you use when you're writing things at a categorical level. Uh, in the Haskell world, it's called point-free or pointless. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so basically it's done by, you know, everything is composition. So you just have to, it can require a lot of rethinking of things as you try to figure out how to compose your operations without ever actually applying them to anything. Because when you're, again, when you're category parametric, when you, you know, you don't know which category you're in, all you can do is compose. Once you actually have a specific category, you can apply those functions, you can do those things. Um, but anything you want to actually have be you know, generically available across categories is, um, has to be done via composition, uh, which can make some, some non-obvious code, which is one of the first problems, right, that, that we'll run into with like, trying to deal with category parametric stuff is some of your code becomes non-obvious um, in, in various ways. Um, so why would we want to have category parametric code? Uh, you know, the quote kind of maybe led a little bit uh, or gave a little bit to that idea, but, but really there's, um, there's this notion of abstraction, right, which we get through all sorts of things, type classes themselves, uh, subtyping, whatever, you know, there's many ways to, to get abstraction in Scala, and, um, um, and, you know, they can really help us eliminate duplication to, like, remove bugs because we're not doing the same work over and over again, uh, and so category theory really gives us kind of an ultimate view of that. It's kind of like... You can, you can eliminate so many things, you can deduplicate stuff, and, and we'll see like, that, that comes up. Um, and so you know, there's, a, there's a really strong argument to be made that like, that kind of reduction of conceptually the same thing, not, not at a surface level, you know, like, oh, it looks like we're doing most of the same thing here, maybe we can like, do that once, but to really, like, you know, at a mathematical level, say these are the same, and, uh, and be able to represent that in your code is, is really helpful and really powerful for eliminating stuff. Um, there's a great talk to, um, by Eugenia Cheng um, called Category Theory in Life, where she talks about how category theory is useful not just in, like, say, math and programming, but, um, but how it affects everything in the world. And uh, it's pretty, pretty great. 
Um, so let's let's start. We'll look at look at functors. Functor is a concept that people raise their hand at before, right? Everybody was pretty uh, pretty content with what a functor is. Um, so this is the categorical diagram of a functor, and uh, I'll kind of walk through what this means pretty pretty quickly. But it sh it should map pretty closely to what you think of as a functor, right? So you have some function f um, from a to b, right? This is the the function parameter you usually give when you're uh, calling map on some functor, right? And um, and then down here we have some f of a to f of b, and again f of f, uh, sorry for the, the conflicting naming there, but, um, but this is the, you know, the, um, the f with the functor applied to it. Now we usually think of it just slightly differently than this, um, where that f is actually, um, let's see, yeah, oops, sorry. yeah. So instead of this, like we map of f is basically how we uh, think of these things, right? So this is this new function is a result of applying of applying map to the original function. So we now have a function um, over the functor. And so, you know, what we have in Scala is somewhat similar to this, but um, but we can get closer to to what this is. And we'll talk about that. So the first the first thing here is regular functor as defined in Cats or Scala Z or any, you know, basically anywhere you see a functor defined, it it looks pretty much like that first one in Scala. Um, <laughs> It's definitely the same thing that we we're just looking at in that other image there, but um, but we can we can shuffle some things around and make it a little bit closer. So the first thing we do is just switch the order of the parameters, right? So we now have to take the function first and then take the f of a. Um, this immediately breaks type inference and things like that, right? So um, again, one of the one of the downsides of trying to do this kind of stuff in in Scala or really in other languages as well. Um, but uh, but there's lots of lots of extra complexities that come in. So this breaks type inference for us already, and then um, and then in the next case we turn that second argument actually into a uh, into a function, right? So it's a it's a map is now a function that takes a function and returns a new function, right? So the function it takes is the top of the functor arrow, and the function it returns is the bottom. So let me get back to show that. Does that make sense? This is the original. This is the f, right? The original function we had, and this is the result of map of f. Gives us a new function from uh, f of a to f of b, right? Which matches exactly this structure, right? So now we have something that looks actually very similar to that category theory diagram, um, which is and it's the same exact functor, right? Like we just shuffled some things around to break type inference, whatever, but it doesn't change the definition at all. Um, it's the same thing. But we're talking about categories here, right? And like this, this ties us to the category skull, which is that category where the objects are types. Right? And the morphisms or arrows are Scala functions, like this. Um, so we can abstract over that. We can replace those arrows. Right? So now, I, as, as I showed in the category slide before, um, we've pulled the, this into a type parameter, which again, different symbol, but designed to, meant to look very much like the normal Scala arrow. Um, we've added that to the functor and said that and replace the arrows here with that. So now we can actually create functors in different categories. Right? This now lets us specify some other category, like Kleisley, which we already saw, uh, instead of just um, instead of just skull, and, and use the same endofunctor definition um, for both of those categories and for many other categories that exist. Um, so the other thing we can do though is notice that there's there's nothing here that like you know in any way requires these two arrows to be the same arrow. Um, so we can actually make them two different arrows. Um, so is everybody, does, do people know the term endofunctor? So an endofunctor is what, what Scala's normal functor and Haskell's normal functor and whatever is an endofunctor, uh, which means that it's a functor from a category to that same category, right? So here's the source category is what the, represented by this arrow, and here's the destination category, and they're the same. So this is an endofunctor. That's hence the name endofunctor here. To, to make it clear that you know it has to be the source and destination of the same category, but in a categorical sense, a, a general functor uh, can be between any two categories. They can be different categories than the source and destination. So that's what that's what this does by adding a second type parameter, uh, which unfortunately looks very similar to the first one, um, with just the bar at the front here. But this is the source category and this is the destination category, and so now in regular Scala. We have a functor type, which I've called exofunctor since 
regular functor was like just functor was already taken to mean endo functors in Scala. Um, but this is this is a very general uh, functor now, right? We can now use different categories for the source and destination, um, and we can uh, yeah, and we'll see what we can do with it. Um, so we can get endo functor back again just by saying that you know its single type parameter is passed as both the, the source and destination category for the for the exo functor, right? Uh, and so this gives us back that same definition we had oops, two slides earlier here, right? Um, just kind of as a type alias. And then we can specialize that endo functor uh, with function one, which is the arrow for the category skull, to get back our original functor. And we get back, you know, that, that same way we had re rewritten functor, where you have uh, takes a function and returns a function, right? So now we see that that original functor is just a specialization of this intercategory functor, an exo functor. Um, and it's exactly the same definition, actually, in this case. So it's, it's great. Um, so what else can we do with this? I mean, like all we've done is abstracted and then got back to our original thing, uh, which doesn't really buy you anything. But, uh, but you can define other functors. Uh, who's familiar with traverse as a type class? Um, so traverse called traversable in Haskell um, is, uh, is something that turns out is also a functor. Um, you have to squint a little bit to see it in the, in the usual definition, but, uh, but it's actually an endo functor, oops, an endo functor in a Claisley category, right? So that means your input you know, has that shape of the, the Claisley arrow, which is the A to B you know, with the, the result wrapped in that M, right, like here. And also, the result, right, the, the output category is the same category. It's f of a, and here that's your that's your input object, and here's your destination object, right? And the m is the same m that's on the uh, on the input arrow. So this is an endo functor in a Claisley category. Is traverse. There's one little difference here you'll notice, which normally on traverse, this type parameter is on the definition of traverse, which would be here. It's called map because it's just a functor. Um, but here we have it pulled up into the type class. This actually gives us a little bit of flexibility. Uh, normally, there's a constraint. M has to be applicative uh, on, on traverse. And so here's you know standard, standard traverse instance uh, for option, uh, which you know has that applicative constraint there. It's part of the, the definition of the traverse instance. Uh, I didn't bother to write out the implementations, but I, I promise they're good. Um, and uh, and yeah, so this is a fairly standard one. Most most instances would have this kind of constraint, right? For some M that has an applicative, we can define a traverse over M for option. Um, but it actually, in some cases, we don't need that constraint. Notice the uh, if, if your instance is for identity uh, as your functor, then you don't need any constraint on M. Uh, you can just uh, um, you you know you can use any any M whatever. You don't even need a functor instance to define this. So you actually have a more general case than you can define with standard traverse. Uh, and then in this case, we have an instance for I/O, but I/O isn't traversable, right? Like you can't like pull a monad outside of an I/O context, and uh, because you would have to actually perform the I/O, right, in order to get that monad to pull it out. But it turns out if your uh, if your monad is uh, is identity, um, and actually I think it's a bit broader than that, but for the purposes of this talk, it's identity. Um, you can actually do it and uh, because identity is nothing, basically. So you can define a traverse instance with a more constrained thing than applicative, right? So we can either do less or more constrained with this version of the traverse definition. Um, and in this case, identity you know, basically makes the mana disappear. So if you're in the Claisley category for identity, um, your traverse is identical to regular functor, right? You know, the mana is basically like a, a no-op. So, um, so this is actually just the same as functor, um, which Makes me wonder if uh, you know if that's a reasonable definition of functor. It's probably not. I mean, it compiles, but it's probably not something you actually want to deal with wrapping and unwrapping ID. Although Scala is pretty good at like just doing that magically for you sometimes. Um, but yeah, probably not something you actually want to do. Uh, so those were those were endo functors we were talking about. Uh, we can do with that same you know. So those are ones right where both the source and destination category were the same category. Scal is a regular functor. Traverse was for Claisley um, categories. 
And so here's some other variations, though. We have what's, um, I don't think there's a real name for this, but it's in blog posts and stuff I've seen, it's been called a Kleisley functor, which is a functor from a Kleisley category to Scal. And, um, and so this is basically a functor that gets rid of its monad in some way, right? It gets, it gets rid of whatever the Kleisley monad is. Um, one case of this, um, I don't know if this is a very well-known type class in CATS. It's called functor filter. Um, in Haskell, there's a library called, there's a f actually like three different versions of this exact same thing, um, but like uh, compactable. And there's an operation called map maybes, and maybe there's a map option somewhere in Scala, I don't know, but there's definitely map filter. Uh, and so what this does is it takes a function from A to option of B, right? So you either get a B or you get none, um, and then returns uh, a function from f of a to f of b. So for example, if f is lists, right, and you pass it something that returns a maybe, or sorry, an option, um, whenever it returns none, we don't preserve that value, we just throw it away. So the list can like get shorter by applying this functor, right? So we can start off with a list of like 10 items, apply some function where half of them uh, turn out to be none in the result, and then we end up with a five item list left at the end, right? All the, all the options have been thrown, or all the nones uh, have been thrown away. Uh, and again, it's just a functor, it's just map. Um, but we tend to have different, different names and different type classes for these things. Uh, also, flat map, which is a type class that's a super class of, uh, of monad, um, is a Kleisley functor where the Kleisley and the functor type are the same. The Kleisley monad and the functor type are the same. Um, right? Because if we get that stacked, you know, like f of f of a in a monad, we have a join operation that lets us collapse those together, right? So we take advantage of that here. So you can get from some normal Kleisley operation, you can then apply it and, uh, and get f of a to f of b. And that's, that's the definition of flat map. Again, just a functor. Um, and this last one uh, is basically the dual of that. Uh, if you're familiar with common ads or anything like that, you do the same thing. This is, um, you get the same, well, the, the dual of, of that notion, which is co-flat map, also called extend. Um, but those are a much less used concept. But anyway, you can see that there's, you know, what I pulled out, five concrete different functors that are usually exist in different type classes, have different sets of laws and tests and stuff to go with them all, um, when really you can define all that stuff once and share it between all these things. Um, let's see. Yeah. And to extend it a little bit farther, we have a notion of a, a dual or opposite category. Every category has a dual category. Um, as I just kind of mentioned with the, uh, the co-Kleisley stuff, this is the dual of Kleisley. And so what dual does is it takes, uh, we, well, to get the opposite category, which is the dual of the original category, you take the original category in here, right? And normally you would have an arrow, say, from A to B in that category. But all the dual does is apply the same arrow using the destination of the original category as the source, right? So it just reverses A to B to B to A. Duality is, if you can abstract things far enough away, duality is just that simple. Uh, in practice, in like working with programming languages, it can be a lot more complicated to, to see what's actually uh, there. Um, so using this notion, uh, we can define this uh, fairly generic thing called a pre-sheaf, which given some category uh, is, a, is a functor from the opposite category of that to the original category. Uh, and if we specialize this category to be function one, giving us the category skull, um, we get back a contravariant functor. Right, so given a function b to a, you get back f of a to f of b. And so yet again, like some fairly common type class we see um, that is just a functor. Um, the one thing that can be complicated with dealing with duality is uh, everything has a unique dual, but that unique dual is unique to that category. So if you take the opposite, so in this example, uh, if you take the opposite of uh, an arrow in the Kleisley category, you actually just switch to A and B, right? So you go from A to F of B to B to F of A because that F, right, is part of the category. It's not part of the objects. But if you're in the category skull and you have the same exact input function, right, A to F of B, in this case, the F is part of the, the destination object, right? And so taking the dual of this um, actually gives you the, the comanatic uh, operation, the co-Kleisley one. So, Applying these things can get a little uh, confusing, right? Like knowing like where, at what level you should apply them. Thankfully, the type system helps you out. You get things that don't make sense or don't compile, 
and you can kind of massage them into place. But this is definitely a place where I found um, myself getting confused as I've, I've tried to automatically generate duels of various constructions, um, which is something I won't get into in this talk. But it's it's uh, you can actually like generate tons of tons of um, construction just by dualizing other things in, in Scala or whatever. Um, and another case, uh, if have people heard the, the 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 comment or whatever that set is not a functor? I feel like this is an argument that comes up all the time in like Scala Z or Cats or whatever. People come in and be like, "No, oh, I mean, set is a functor. I like I wanted to have a functor on a set. I want to have map, and map is defined on set. And like the people argue about whether it's you know a good definition or not. Um, well, it turns out that you can use what are called subcategories with this definition of of category. So I can define a new category. Now, what a subcategory is to to clarify that is a uh, hopefully I, I think the name is is you know a good one for for once, um, but a subcategory is a is basically a category that is created by removing certain objects and morphisms from another category. So in this case, in this ORD function, um, we're only keeping the objects that have order instances, right? That have some kind of way to do less than greater than, um, and therefore only keeping the morphisms that can connect ordered types to other ordered types. Right? So we've stripped out the rest of Skull and just kept those, those pieces of Skull. And so by defining this category um, as this type here, this is the arrow type for it, we can define an exo functor from, uh, from this, this subcategory to um, function 1. Right? And so we first take a, a function between ordered types, and we get back a, a function between sets. Uh, which are just in Skull. And so now we actually have a valid um, functor instance for, Scala, uh, for sets, uh, but it has to be an exo functor because those are two different categories, right? We're going from a subset of, uh, of Skull to the full set of, or to, to Skull as a category. Um, and so, so yeah, it can't be defined, well, it, you can define it, but it can't be defined in a, um, say, law abiding way uh, without doing something like this kind of exo functor. And again, this compiles, um, which actually kind of surprised me, um, that I could uh, put the constraints where I did and have things work out. And in this case, it just takes a list, right? This, or sorry, it takes a set of numbers, um, and uh, and it figures out if they're even or not, and returns the booleans, um, saying you know whether or not each one was even. And of course, the result set is just a two-element set, true and false. Uh, there's definitely nothing in functor that says that it can't affect the shape. You don't. There's nothing in the laws of functor that says like the output has to be the same as the input or the, the shape of it, right? So like as we saw in the earlier thing with the Kleisley, with the function filter, or functor filter, um, that this can lose elements, right? This can lose elements from the list. And the set, um, the output set can be a different size than the input set when we have, um, when we have something like this. So there's, there's nothing there that says like it can't affect the shape at all. So I'm going to talk about other kinds of functors. Um, and the word kind there is, is um, somewhat important. Um, kind, so you know values have types, and types have kinds. Are people familiar with the term kinds? OK, okay so um, things of different kinds. Let's, let's go. So one thing is, is a proper type, well, let's say. right? Like a proper type is like A here. It has no type parameters. Let me go back like a oops, slide here. Yeah, OK, this is a good one. Um, so A is a proper type. It, has, it takes no type parameters, also called kind star often. Um, whereas this F is a type constructor. It takes one type parameter, and when it receives that type parameter, it is now a proper type, right? So F of A would be a proper type itself. And so that is often written star, arrow, star. So it takes a proper type star of kind star, and then when you apply that, the result is of kind star also. Uh, this one takes two proper types, and then when both are applied, it returns a proper type. So these are all different kinds. The kind basically refers to the shape of the type parameter or of the, the type itself, right? The, the list of the type parameters in the type declaration. Um, and so we're talking about different kinds here. We, we've been talking about you know, arrows that take two proper types, right? Like the input type and the output type. So all of our, all of our functors and everything we've looked at have, uh, have so far been cases where the objects are Scala types. Uh, in the case of subcategories, it's not all of the Scala types, but, um, but they're all Scala types or a subset of Scala types. 
And so what we'd like to do is define functors for cases where the objects are not Scala types. Uh, and so here's the exo functor we had before. And we basically can do that by adding an you know, extra type parameter to everything, right? So see, so it just adds, adds another set of brackets to each thing, basically. Right? So now we're dealing with at the level of functors, where this A, the same A we had before, right, still called A, but now A is a functor itself, and B is a functor, and we now have an arrow between functors, right? and the result arrow is also between functors. So this added uh, like a higher kind to all of these things. Um, and there is a type class that exists that, that uses this called hoist, um, which is used if, who's familiar with monad transformers? I think that's the, the most common case of this kind of thing is uh, in a monad transformer, you have a shape like this generally. And if you apply a normal functor to it, it's going to change the type of this part. But sometimes when you have something of this shape, you want to change what this is, right? This argument is. And, and notice that that has a different shape, right? This is a functor, whereas this type parameter is a proper type. Um, and so hoist is a, uh, is a functor that operates over this type instead of over the um, this is your regular Scala functor would operate over. And so um, this is the exo functor k. The k just indicates it's a higher kind um, than the previous exo functor. Um, and its arrows are natural transformations, uh, which are called function k in Scala, uh, which are functions between functors. right? So you would have a function from f to g instead of from a to b, basically, the way these things are usually named. Um, and in fact, this could, um, this, you know, we could have aliased, uh, made a type for the endo functor k also, and this could just be endo functor because hoist is an endo functor um, in the category of uh, natural transformations. Or sorry, in the category of functors. Um, so we can, you know, we can duplicate this stuff at a different level. And we can do the same thing as other categories, right? So a bi functor has our normal category shape, right, which is just like takes proper types. But a bifunctor is a functor that takes a product category, which is a product of two, which a product category is two categories, basically. So both the single line arrow and the double line arrow are both input categories, uh, and basically a tuple of them. And you see that here, right? This is basically a tuple um, of, uh, of the two categories. And then the output category is just a regular category. Um, and so there's the result with like, if we apply both A and B, right, to the F, we now get F of A and B, and we can get that in the second category there. So we can define, you know, this, this generic bifunctor, and the naming here, I'm sorry, is a little unfortunate. This is a categorical bifunctor, uh, which is much more flexible than what we think of as a bifunctor. This bifunctor prime, uh, by the way, this prime character um, is, uh, is valid in, in Scala. It's not actually the apostrophe. Um, but it's a valid identifier character, and we just use it to uh, allow a compilation to happen, basically, because sometimes we use you know, the same names and, uh, and things that are semantically the same, but, uh, but um, you know, have to be written multiple times and in different definitions, so things do not conflict with each other. Um, so regular bifunctor can be defined as this generic category theory bifunctor, where all the categories are skull, right? So we get our normal this is exactly what we expect bimap to look like, basically, right? Um, this exact thing. And, uh, and that's what we have. So we specialized it all down. Uh, and then we have profunctors. Uh, if people are familiar, that's uh, where there's a contravariant and, and covariant functor. It's also, so they have a product functor where the first category is contravariant, and the second category is covariant. And, um, and this, again, can be specialized from bifunctor, where your input categories are the opposite Right, that's your contravariant arrow, and uh, and the uh, other input one is regular, not not reversed. And then the destination for a profunctor is always skull. Um, that's that's just part of the category theory definition. Uh, and so we can define profunctor prime as a specialization of this category theory profunctor, where again they're both specialized to function one, and the profunctorness of it switches the one to be contravariant. Um, and there's another way. This hom functor is another specialization of bifunctor, which also gives us the same definition of profunctor once it's specialized this way. Um, but we don't need to go into that. All right. So what problems do we run into with this kind of thing? Um, 
Like, in some ways, this, you get a lot of generis, generic whatever. It becomes much more generic. And we cannot repeat things. We can share laws between things. Um, but this breaks type inference all over the place. You don't want to use it directly. Uh, you spend a lot of time unwrapping and wrapping like types, like for Kleisley. It's just like wrapper around a function so that you, you can write um, new instances on it. It's like a new type, as it would be called in, uh, in Haskell, uh, sort of in the same vein. And so you end up doing unwrapping and wrapping, and your code gets uglier. Um, type class inheritance can become difficult because, for example, we have both traverse and functor both give you a map operation, right? But you can't actually have two map operations on the same thing. Like it was nice when we had traverse as a traverse operation and, and map as the map operation, right? Uh, and there are ways to get around those things, but again, it makes you're jumping through more hoops, making code more ugly. Um, and the, the worst part is that it, it gives you a little taste of, uh, of something that I at least want more of when I can like define all these things um, in various ways. Uh, and so we will, let's see here. Um, skip over some stuff. Um, so we can do the same thing with monoids. And one thing I wanted to show here uh, with monoids ah, is we'll jump, jump ahead a little bit. So we have basically this categorical monoid that we want to specialize to. Oh, yeah, a monad uh, is just a category, or just, sorry, a monad is just a monoid in the category of endofunctors, which is exactly what this says basically, right? Here's a monoid. Won't get into all this stuff. But if instead of just doing a type alias, as I did before with like traverse and functor, right, you can, you can make things a bit cleaner by. Here's the very generic operations. And you can see that they're kind of ugly. Um, but I define them in terms of the, the operations you would normally define for functor, or for, sorry, for monads in this case, right? Pure and join. So someone implementing or an instance of a monad can write something, and you could do bind in here, but join um, just falls naturally out of this definition. Um, but in any case, like you can define mon and monad instance the way you normally would, and you effectively get the generic monoid case for free. Uh, here and um, uh, and so you know it hides some of that complexity. The complexity still exists in the code, which is unfortunate. A lot of libraries definitely encourage you to look through the code and see how things work and stuff like that. And and this can make things a little bit more uh, opaque than they need to be. But the idea is that it shouldn't affect people writing instances, and you, you can hide that stuff um, from them there. And applicative is also uh, just a monoid uh, in with a different set of parameters. So all these things are like you end up with like you know one generic type. Uh, in this case, monoid, um, that you can specialize down to things that you're familiar with, you know, applicatives and, uh, and monads in this case. Um, and, and categories also. A category itself is also a monoid, right? Where you have the identity operation. Um, <laughs> ignore, ignore the stuff on the screen. Um, but it's, it's, just, it's, a, it's a monoid in the category of profunctors. Uh, so this, it kind of gets cyclical, right? Like you define a monoid in this categorical abstraction, and you can define category itself as a monoid. Um, and finally, we can we can reduce all these things even further by using this bit of magic that's new to Scala in type level Scala and in um, and in Dottie uh, called kind polymorphism, where those kinds that I mentioned before, this is a fake type, right? This isn't a real type bound. Uh, but all that this says is like this isn't really an underscore. It says that this could be an underscore, or it could be an underscore bracket underscore, or it could be like any shape you want it to be. And only by the things that it's related to, otherwise in the definitions, will it constrain which ones have to be the same. And then when you can make a concrete version by passing in things like you know like types like this, and it will give you the specific like pr you know monoid on proper types. In this case, if you give it different types, um, you get your uh, monoids. This is, this is the same monoid definition that that any kinded one, but instead of giving it a function one, you're giving it a function k, natural transformation. And so now you're defining monoids uh, in the category of endofunctors, so applicatives and monads, uh, again, just as type aliases. But um, yeah, and the same for type ca for categories. Um, and just, again, given different parameters to the exact same, mon so you've defined one monoid, and you can get everything out of it. I mean, you get like, basically everything is either a monoid or a functor, as far as I can tell. Those are the only two things that actually exist. Um, Unfortunately, Scala's any kind uh, kind polymorphism doesn't seem quite strong enough to be able to define a polymorphic uh, kind polymorphic functor. Uh, if someone can solve this, that would be great. Um, I can't figure out how to do it. And functor is so fundamental to so many abstractions that without this, you can't really get very far with kind polymorphism. Uh, so this is a big hurdle to overcome. Um, hopefully, there's a there's a feature that is there's an open issue. I don't know if there's any work done. 
um, to, to hopefully give us some way of solving this. Uh, I'll skip to that. And uh, that's it for me. Um, kind of sped through the end there, but sorry. Uh, again, I work at Formation. I would like to thank um, people who have written things to make all of this possible. Uh, Eric Oshim, who has written Kind Projector, uh, which makes partially applying types feasible. Um, Pascal wrote the Kind Polymorphism uh, extension for Scala C. Uh, and Miles Sabin for managing type level Scala and all those other wonderful things he does. Rob Norris, who has given me lots of feedback um, and told me of all the crazy things that I should take out of my talk. Um, so you should thank him because it could be so much worse. Um, and type, type level have provided so many libraries that make it so relatively easy to do lots of crazy things in Scala. Um, the Scala IO for, for inviting me in the first place. And, uh, and so many other people in the Scala community who have helped me understand these things and continue to help me with that. Uh, and I hope that I can uh, pay some of that forward. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Any questions? Are people still alive? <laughs> <laughs> okay, stupid question, yeah. admittedly. But do you, how much of this do you actually use in production code? Um, in Scala, I use very little of it. I would like to use calling polymorphism more. I think that would be great. It's, there's some shortcomings. In other languages, uh, even in Haskell, I actually don't, don't use it that much. But, um, but there are some other languages that um, have things like kind polymorphism where uh, you use it pretty ubiquitously. Uh, and we, we have these very generic definitions of functors and stuff. Like it comes with a language or? The kind polymorphism does. Right. Um, but we've had to implement functor and Okay. And uh, and yeah, and, and all these these types in a way because the reasons that I'll mention the language is called Dal if anyone's familiar with it. But um, the reasons it's it's a it's a very cool language D H A L L. Um, but uh, kind polymorphism exists in it for a different purpose, basically than all the stuff we're doing with it. But because it exists, we right. um, can do all of these things, and it, it works very well in that context. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, is it feasible, ignoring ergonomics, uh, to write a performant library that actually uses this abstraction but then compiles to something reasonable? Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> um, so actually a lot of the stuff like, uh, really the, the performance issues that we've had with things like this um, are at compile time, not at runtime. Uh, like things like kind polymorphism are completely erased by runtime. Um, it's you pay that cost when you're compiling, um, and sometimes it can be a big cost. Uh, but uh, but it's been good. I've worked with people on my team who have had um, very good knowledge of Scala C and Scala C internals and have um, managed to take you know some things that are like kind of a bit too close to say the category theory and and restructure them in a way we get the same effect. Um, but taking more advantage of, of how the Scala compiler does things. Um, and, uh, and so that's not me, but that other people I've worked with who you know, really know how Scala C works. Because I, I definitely come into it as like, oh, here's abstraction, abstraction, abstraction. And they go, why did that take 10 minutes to compile? I'm like, I don't know. And then I like reshuffle some things. I was like, oh, that code looks, you know, it looks pretty close to the same thing, but now it like, compiles in seconds. And, um, so I think that you really, to be able to do these things, you need someone like that. If not, have everybody you know have that knowledge. So that that's an, that's another problem for sure that you need a deep knowledge of uh, how things work in order to to make this stuff actually perform. But again, at compile time. But compile time, right? We compile constantly, right? We're just constantly like make a change, compile, make a change, compile. So it it does matter. I mean, it's not runtime, but it matters. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, this is a silly question. Um, you've got uh, stuff where you have some form of operation and you tweak some parameter and you get some kind of different operation with those functors and exo functors. Uh, there's another thing that looks a little bit like that, which is a, a junctions. <laughs> <laughs> have you given any thought about it? 
Yeah, yeah. And I, I've actually left adjunctions very specifically out of the stock. Um, no, that's, that's great that you ask about it, though. Um, no, adjunctions is a big motivation for this kind of thing, actually. Because in like Scal or Hask or whatever, there's not many adjunctions you can define. Right? You need to start getting into like, where you can actually abstract over categories to be able to define more than, say, two useful adjunctions. Um, and what I would like to be able to do is get to a point where we actually have tons of adjunctions because it can, we can get rid of monad transformers if we do that. Uh, because then we just end up with inst monad instances on compositions of monads where there's an adjunction between them. And, uh, and that, you know. But anyway, I, I think that that's a nice way to do it. But we have, currently have no way to get to that level of, of adjunctions. But I, that's totally a, a goal. <laughs> Any more questions? No? Okay. Thank you, Greg.